Thank you so much for being here with us for AWS AI Innovation uh, Infrastructure Innovation Day. I'm Am Grabelny, one of your hosts with Jasmine Kyles. We're here all day, Jasmine. We are exciting, exciting stuff. But we've got some new friends down here at the end. Ben from Monks, do you want to introduce yourself first? Yes, yeah, I'm a te senior technical architect at Monks, and uh, we're a digital marketing and technical solutions company. All right. And hey, folks, I'm Devakar Bansal. I'm a senior go-to-market specialist at AWS, and I work with uh, companies like uh, uh, Gen AI developers like Monks to uh, consult and optimize their workloads on EC2 infrastructure. And I cover AWS AI chip screening and inferentia for a go-to-market perspective. Now, I always love a good take it a project to production story, Ben. That is one of my favorite things uh, as, as a software dev myself, doing it a couple times. It is nerve wracking. Uh, <laughs> it is life changing sometimes. Sure. And there's always a story, right? Yeah. But do you want to tell us a little bit about the project that we're going to be talking about first? Yeah, so uh, at the, this solution, we're looking to uh, take user input, in this case, form of like a free form text, and then generate a Gen AI image, as well as some voice cloning for some audio, and then also give the user a real near real time video output that they could take away and yeah. download. So yeah, there's a lot of challenges there, but uh, to act on the team. Yeah, Ben, let's look at the architecture because what you guys have done using a multimodal approach to build an end-to-end -end application using LLMs, text input, generating images, and then video generation is, is pretty cool. What I love to see here is um, is all the different AWS services, both from a compute standpoint, the SageMaker uh, endpoint, and optimization using the scale-out on SageMaker, Inferentia 2, Lambda, the functions. There's a lot of goodness here in this architecture. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, we, we like to try and use managed services whenever we can, and uh, so serverless, things like that. But essentially, if you look at this diagram, we sort of split out the core components into sort of main microservices, if you like. So like I said, we had, we're taking user input, so we've got a user input moderation layer. Then we have the actual image generation microservice. This is where the interesting stuff, similar to uh, Hunter's uh, presentation just earlier, we used in French on that, and we can, we'll get to that in a second. It's SageMaker to actually run Stable Diffusion XL. So very similar to that demo we just saw. And then we had a video generation microservice, and that's where we sort of tried to pull everything together. So, you know, like I said, we were grabbing the user input, the image we generated, uh, we're doing some voice cloning, and then, you know, sort of mashing that all together and outputting a video that the users could download. Very nice. So you, you, you actually, I mean, this is not a simple uh, simple task, I would say, Ben, because you're, you're, you're actually taking multi-different types of media, putting those together, and then delivering a product to an end user who's using this, right, with the latency and considerations that you have to take when you are working directly with user input, right? Um, so I'm sure, right, you're, you're also working with several models here, too. I'm sure you uh, had some challenges around you know, optimizing things. So let's, you, you mentioned stable diffusion. Let's talk about stable diffusion. What what types of challenges did you see scaling out the usage of stable diffusion in this architecture? Yeah, well, I mean, these larger models, as I'm sure anyone who is watching the show has know, you know, scaling these larger models is really quite challenging, whether it's an LLM, whether it's something stable diffusion. Uh, so that was one problem is being able to actually take this to scale. Let's say if we want looking at, I know Dirac, we, we came to you and asked for help and we we're saying we're expecting, you know, let's say thousands of concurrent users a second. How do yeah. we do this? So the first part is we we investigated uh, inferential chipsets for the actual um, uh, generation of the image, for the actual inference. And that allowed us to hit, hit a goal. We, we'd set a goal of around 10 seconds for our inference. And we managed to achieve that uh, using those those that instance type. And then the second part of the puzzle is, like I said, is then actually scaling it. So great you can generate one image in 10 seconds but how yeah. do you generate you know thousands per second and uh, you know and, and, and that's us. what i see in in a lot of gen ai workloads as well right doing a poc with a fewer nodes and just a few set of images is one thing but then scaling it out to thousands of users and millions of images is a whole other story right because you have to look at the performance you have to optimize the cost you have to look at the availability of the instances you have to look at different geographical regions where this is going to be deployed at and then using inferentia 2 and uh a stage maker endpoints um uh, from amazon monks were able to scale this out in a very cost effective manner 
Another piece is uh, when you use a stable diffusion model, you have to fine tune it for the specific purpose. And Monks also used EC2 infrastructure to fine tune that model specifically mm -hmm. for the application. And again, an end-to-end -end story where AWS infrastructure provided great scale out, great user experience in a cost-effective manner was uh, was a really cool part of working with the Monks here. Uh, I know, uh, do you want to talk to some of the KPIs here uh, that you were uh, behind uh, attaining Ben and how did you achieve those? Yeah, well, like I said, the um, main one was definitely bringing the inference time down, as we mentioned. But actually, if you don't mind popping to the next slide, we can see how by using uh, the asynchronous endpoints available in SageMaker rather than sort of standard synchronous ones, mm -hmm. but the, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a built-in queuing system. So everything is fully managed. Again, like I said, that's what we like to prefer to use if we can. And that gave us resili resilience and, and sort of comfort in knowing that when we did get those spikes in crazy traffic, we would be able to scale up. And one of the other challenges we had is because it's a larger model, is scaling in, uh, scaling latency, something people don't normally think about, that it's going to take, instead of seconds to spin up new machines, it's going to take minutes. And so that obviously is going to impact your response time. So having that queuing system built into the asynchronous endpoints was uh, really helpful. And here, actually, in this slide, we can see uh, at the top there, we have the we have to generate our own custom metric yeah, to scale. That's on. your scaling metric, isn't it? Yeah, I'm not going to go into too much detail right now, but one of our, actually one of our senior devs, Neo, he did a lot of work into figuring that out um, and how we could use some available uh, CloudWatch metrics to, to do that. But long story short, uh, we would use that as our target uh, in our scaling policy. So if we see the uh, the response chart down at the bottom here, we have in blue the our capacity. So how many Im images per minute can we process? And then I'll sort of how many requests are coming in in the same time frame. And you'll see that at the start, the experience, we deliberately over capacity, uh, we made sure we over provisioned because so we knew we had this uh, latency in the scaling. And uh, as, as the experience went along and we sort of started to uh, see patterns in the, in the traffic, we could then start to develop a schedule and we can see the up and down sort of square roller coaster there. That's a scaling up and down on a schedule. But then you'll see the spikes as well that you'll notice there's a still, there's a spike in the orange and then a corresponding spike in the blue. Yeah. And that's where we're using a, a Neo's a custom metric to, to scale up. That's amazing. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I love the data driven approach to scaling. Absolutely. Obviously it makes total sense. I imagine there's also some data driven decision making around the, the actual instance types that you chose, right? Can you talk about that? Can you talk through how you actually, you know, landed on? Well, I mean, to quite honestly, I'm not sure there's much more to, to I can really add that uh, other than um, Hunter. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Do I Be before I answer the question on Infrancia 2 yeah, aspect, please. I want to touch back on over provisioning that Ben mentioned. Yeah. yeah. When we initially talked about this project, we did some calculations and it seemed like we are going to need thousands of compute nodes to deploy this project across thousands of users and millions of images. And obviously that was very cost prohibitive for Monk's team to deploy the project. And once we started using uh, Infrancia 2, look into the performance of that combined with uh, SageMaker asynchronous endpoints that came to a manageable number of nodes that provided the right performance at the right compute costs. Now, talking about Infrancia 2, I think the reason Monk's team were able to effectively use Infrancia 2 is because their metrics were primarily uh, latency on stable diffusion Excel model. And as we heard in one of the previous presentations on AWS AI chips, we designed these uh, AI chips based instances for um, for training and inference of Gen AI workloads like LLMs, stable diffusion, uh, and it provides very cost efficient and performant um, approach to fine tuning, training, and deployment of these workloads. And once uh, we combined that with the requirements that Monk's team had here, we found Infrancia 2 was a perfect fit given the latency requirement, the scale out that SageMaker mm -hmm. provided. And Optimum Neuron, we talked about Hugging Face, we saw a presentation, it was very timely, it was a critical component of enabling uh, Infrancia 2 deployment and SageMaker deployment uh, for Monk's application. Do you want to talk about that, Optimum Neuron? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. It's, it's a good example of how uh, collaboration between ourselves and, and AWS and the Dracus team is, uh, we have mentioned the, the scaling latency. Uh, quick note on that, actually, I think a few days ago, there's a blog post on the machine learning blog now uh, where it sounds like that's now been fixed and these larger models can uh, now scale much faster, which is great news. But on to, to the point about Hugging Face, uh, when we used Infrancia, we had to sort of split uh, the model and, and compile down certain parts of it to actually run on, on the chips. And so there's a little bit of a barrier to entry, but now that's been eliminated with, yeah. with the Hugging Face Optimum uh, Optimex um, library, it's really easy now to do, do training and inference on, on yeah. such models on 
in French. Yeah. yeah. And what I really like about these uh, engagements with companies like Monks is that I, I, I often forget when, when customers become our intimate partners mm -hmm. and start influencing our product roadmap. And that's exactly what happened here, right? We consulted them on use of EC2 infrastructure and SageMaker and other AWS services for yeah. efficient deployment of end applications. But in return, uh, Monks team was giving us feedback on how we can improve our product portfolio with yeah. asynchronous endpoint latency improvement and optimum neural on improvisations with Hugging Face and AWS altogether. Yeah. So great deal of uh, good stuff to to speak about that. Yeah, I love hearing about this full life cycle of how this uh, proof of concept <laughs> went, you know, it went from, hey, you know, we need to tell it is what you need. You know, we're looking at some costs. We're finding solutions for that. And now, hey, guess what? I need to tell you what's next on the roadmap because we built it and we want to run and run fast. Yeah, yeah, we, we've had that experience in a number of uh, things. It's, it's it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Well, show us the demo. Yeah, we want to see, see it. what it is that you've built and what you're how you're using this. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I think I'm going to give a, a bit of background. So uh, in the architecture, we said we, this is multimodal, and um, we talked about obviously scaling the image generation side. And when it came to generating the video, we actually used Graviton there, so that helped to scale that piece. But the piece of the puzzle now is how do you scale the LLM? So all those services used LLMs in one way or another. Here we're looking sort of at an example of the moderation. Mm -hmm. So we'd have all these agents that would uh, moderate different parts of the user input. But uh, like I said, it's used by other services for other reasons too. Uh, so anyone who's used a, an API when it comes with a large language model knows they come with quite strict quotas in terms of requests and tokens you can use. And also if you try to balance your load across uh, multiple regions, there's latency, huge latency variations between regions, big trouble. And like I said, when you're trying to scale to large numbers, we knew that was going to be a problem if we didn't solve it. So we sort of came up with this uh, concept of an LM cache. So it's, we're using uh, embeddings to try and capture the meaning of the user's input. Again, very similar to what Hunt, Hunter was talking about as well. So we're capturing that semantic meaning and then we're storing that in a vector store. We use Pinecone and... Um, and then with that, we can then take the user input and try and find something similar. We're not something that's exactly the same. So not a keyword match, but something that's similar. So we get yeah. more hits. And so long story short, let's uh, take a quick look at this here. So I'm going to put in, oh, I'm going to put in bread if I can type. There we go. My yeah. favorite food. <laughs> So of you can course. see this one took uh, just about, uh, that's actually quite fast, but um, if I jump over here, we're, the whole uh, system's being um, orchestrated with step functions. So that's what we're seeing on the right here. But if I jump in here, uh, we can see uh, oh, this one actually missed the, actually hit the, yeah. We didn't hit the LLM because it was uh, already cached. Okay. But then if I come in here and I put like bagel, for example, so we think in a you know, standard keyword right. query, these two things aren't the same. So you would expect to get a cache uh, miss here. Mm -hmm. But if I hit that, we can say we've got another cache hit and see we're around a second for the inference time. And uh, if I jump back here really quickly, and let me jump back into this, we can see here, again, it's uh, come down here and we've missed the LLM service. So we can see that in the inference time being low because that would normally be two, three seconds. Right. But then I can also come here and I put something like pasta. Again, these mm. things don't seem all that similar, but in our in our case, they are similar and I'm, I'm happy for them to be a match. So let's see if uh, and the model, the embedding that we generated also thinks that Pasta is bread based. Yes. Yeah. I guess for the ingredients, it is. So in, again, in our use case, so we, we just got two times more, you know, three times more hits in our cache than we would have done with like a more traditional kind of search. Mm -hmm. And 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 this is because if you wanted to use this approach on like a chatbot, you right. need to be able to understand the semantic meaning of the user's input. And it could be, that wouldn't be just a single word. It could be a whole sentence. Right. Right. And so trying to find this. Yeah, exactly. Context is important. So trying to find a similar, uh, query in the cache based on the context this is where the power of this comes in yeah. and it's all to reduce the uh the, the load against the lm inference exactly yeah and actually in, in this uh in this uh, solution we uh, once the cache was fully sort of loaded up we were getting 93 percent cache hit so okay. huge reduction wow. in LM wow. yeah 93 is really good it's really cash. good yeah <laughs> that's okay yeah that's yep. you always want to hit that cache um yep. I have to ask, this seems like it could solve the eternal question of, is a hot dog a sandwich, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe chat could tell us that too, is a hot dog a sandwich? A hot dog um, is not a sandwich, but okay. I just know. I just know. <laughs> <laughs> your, your uh, <laughs> we are running short of time though, Ben. I, I want to talk about what's next for monks. Yeah, well, I mean, we're obviously uh, in the AI space and uh, continuing our partnership with uh, with AWS as much as possible there. Absolutely. And um, yeah, just... 
we tend to look for, for fun, cool, interesting ways to use AI. And yeah. that's that's pretty much our mission. Yeah. And as uh, as uh, another evidence of the partnership, uh, Monk's team has written a blog with some of my AWS colleagues. Ooh. We'll throw that on the screen. Um, and that blog post has a lot about the stable diffusion-based application, a lot of optimizations, the SageMaker, asynchronous endpoints, Infrensha 2, a lot of good stuff in terms of how Monk's were able to build this application it, in there. Very impressive application too, I must say. I, I really, no, this is incredible. Like night, the, the cache hit uh, percentage is amazing. You know, really optimizing that usage of inference on LLMs is incredible. That's very important. Um, so Ben, if you had to sum it up, what were your, what were you, what'd you walk away from bringing this to production and learn? On this one, uh, uh, I think just the, um, the importance of thinking about uh, scale. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Very simple, very straightforward. <laughs> Thank you both yeah. for joining Thank us. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Jasmine, we're going to stick around. We are. We've got some more uh, content coming up. Yep. We've got the keynote. Yeah, I'm excited for the keynote. So stay tuned. We'll be watching the chat, and then we'll be right back after the keynote to talk to you about it. And we can't wait to see what you learn.